Here we are, we're rolling. So Katrina Manigan is the director of the High Performance Buildings and Homes team for the Denver Office of Climate Action, Sustainability and Resiliency. The team is working to make all new and all existing buildings and homes in Denver net zero energy, more sustainable and more resilient. Woo! Katrina has also led the work to develop the benchmarking ordinance for existing buildings, the Green Buildings Ordinance, the 2019 Denver IECC, the first ever Denver Green Code, and the Energized Denver Building Performance Policy. Welcome, Katrina. <laughs> yeah. Thanks so much for being here. Thank you so much for having me and looking forward to presenting, but also just to you know, taking questions, having a, uh, a good discussion. If folks have questions, feel free to throw them in the chat as I go. Um, it's not a huge group, though I see the attendee list growing a bit. I know I switched times, I think, with another panelist. I saw somebody just asked, um, what happened to the other panelist? I think we have about, my old time slot. We have about 200 and something people who signed up. So that usually means half the people show up. And yeah, I expect that they'll just keep on popcorning in in the first bit here. So um, right. you're welcome to introduce yourself further while people start uh, attending in larger droves. <laughs> okay, well, that sounds good. Um, well, I'll go ahead and just dive in. Uh, the In Denver, buildings and homes account for 64% of our greenhouse gas emissions. About 15% of that is homes, 49% of that is our commercial and multifamily buildings. And so I will go through what work we're doing in the city and county of Denver to really reduce that 49% of greenhouse gas emissions. I'm gonna focus mostly on our buildings work um, here today. So I'll start with uh, just a little bit of, kind of a reminder of why we're here, what climate impacts mean for Denver. Um, you can see that sort of on a business as usual trajectory for emissions, we are going to get more and more days over 100 degrees uh, every year here in Denver. As a kid growing up here, I only saw, you know, an occasional day over 100. Um, and we're, we're going to see more of those um, unless we really reduce emissions. So we are really starting as an office to plan for both climate mitigation and reducing emissions, but also how do we help our community and our built environment be more um, resilient uh, to some of the warming that's going to come. There is, of course, also a really high value for high performance buildings beyond just addressing climate change. We know that um, a high performance building can enhance employee productivity, increase employee retention, improve, improve employee health and wellness. And so all of the strategies you'll hear about today, we see as uh, larger than just uh, about being about climate change. We are also trying to really make Denver a more competitive place to do business, a more attractive place to do business because uh, our buildings deliver all this extra value um, for every square foot uh, that, is, that is rented. And today we're really um, not on track to reach our energy efficiency goals. Um, we have broader goals that I'll get into to really, uh, as the, in my introduction said, get to net zero energy in all our buildings. But that includes reducing energy use 30% by 2030. And today we uh, are, know that our energy use in buildings is increasing every year. Uh, much of the growth is driven by new buildings, uh, but existing buildings are not on the green line. They're sort of uh, about about level every year. We saw a slight decline in 2020, but it was about 2% decline in um, emissions, even sort of through the pandemic in 2020. So for just existing buildings, and we still saw growth because we're adding new buildings. Um, so I'll start just going through our existing building work first. Then all the buildings over 25,000 square feet in Denver have been benchmarking since 2016. This is just measuring and reporting their energy performance. You can see all of that data at energizedenver.org on our map. 
And because we know from five years of data that we're not on track to reach our goals uh, in ex for existing buildings, we formed the Energized Denver Task Force a year ago and asked them to work with us to improve health and equity, create jobs, and bring existing buildings to net zero energy by 2040. So this really diverse group of individuals reached consensus on one set of policy recommendations for us uh, that they really think achieve all these goals that they set out for themselves to have a policy that's really achievable, really effective. Um, it gets eager compliance from building owners while um, being really fiscally attainable and flexible for building uh, for building owners and while really reaching all of our goals. Um, and so I'll walk through what that is. This was uh, moved forward into ordinance as a building performance policy in Denver in November of last year. So here you can see sort of the, I think there's eight cities across the country who have building performance policies. There's others that I've marked here also as orange that have some sort of performance requirements for their existing buildings. And so I wanna walk you through what Denver's uh, Energize Denver uh, policy says, so you understand sort of what's required now of existing buildings. So um, the Energize Denver performance requirements are for the buildings over 25,000 square feet. They have to have a 30% improvement in energy performance by 2030. Uh, and that's on average. So we will be setting a long-term performance target for every building type, or rather we have set those targets in rules and regs that are also now final. Um, and we'll have required interim targets in 2024 and 2027 for every individual building from their own baseline to the final target for that building type. So here on the right, you can see an example on how the policy works for offices. Office A uses a lot more energy today. The metric here is site energy use intensity. So how many KBTUs of energy are used per square foot per year? And um, so Office A has its own interim targets on the way to the same final target. Um, I'll note 15% of our offices already have an energy use intensity that is lower than 48. So they are already fully in compliance as long as they maintain their performance. That's sort of that credit for high performers. Solar, there's a bunch of sort of alternate compliance pathways. If a building can't reach these targets, one of those is really solar. Solar is fully credited towards energy use. Um, and I just saw a question in the chat around why we focused on EUI instead of greenhouse gas emissions. We wanted to focus on a metric that building owners control directly. Greenhouse gas emissions are very much um, shaped by our utility. So um, this set of require our in our grid is getting cleaner very quickly. Um, and we'll have an 80% renewable grid from our local utility. They are a monopoly utility, Excel Energy, that um, is required to be 80% renewable by 2030. Uh, but building owners don't have control over that. So the thing they can control is uh, EUI um, being more efficient helps the grid sort of get to their uh, the, the goals that Excel Energy has um, and has carbon emission reductions uh, in and of itself, especially um, in the short term while the grid is still um, quite dirty. So uh, moving on, there are these alternate options that add flexibility. So a building owner can request a different compliance timeline. Say they have a major renovation planned in 2025. It wouldn't make sense to make, make a bunch of improvements to reach a 2024 target. They can adjust the end goal if there are inherent characteristics of the building or the way it's used that mean they need, they can't reach that EUI target, they need a different goal. There's a prescriptive option um, for some of the smaller buildings where they electrify and do a lighting upgrade. Um, there'll be a separate path for manufacturing and agriculture. Um, that's a pretty high level overview. There's lots of details. Um, I'll just toss in the chat where you can go read all of the details. It's on our Energized Denver Hub. Um, uh, so you can find out all the details. Um, the second half of our Energized Denver policy is that uh, renewable heating and cooling uh, will be required in existing buildings 
when they replace their systems anyway. So when water heating and space heating systems are replaced upon system replacement, when it's cost effective, starting in 2025, heat pumps will be required for easy to electrify systems. That's the big milestone. In 2023, we're gonna make permitting equal for heat pumps and gas systems. Uh, and electrification feasibility reports will be required. We're gonna start offering lots of incentives for electrification um, for those feasibility reports. We'll do a bunch of pilot projects. We'll start rolling out incentives for heat pumps to get ready for the requirements that start in 2025. Um, this is a, triggered again by system replacement. When they go in to pull a permit, um, they'll have to uh, install a heat pump for easy to electrify systems, furnaces, rooftop units, individual water heaters, when it's cost effective. And then in 2027, the harder to electrify system requirements begin. Those are um, PTACs, boilers, central hot water systems, any like sort of hydronic systems are much harder to electrify today. Um, we have a renewable heating and cooling plan in place uh, that I'll go through a few of the details there, but if you just Google Denver Renewable Heating and Cooling, you will find all the analysis that went into all the cost numbers behind sort of how we arrived at these policy recommendations. So um, may I ask um, Katrina yeah. to elaborate on that? Because that's why you were invited. <laughs> that's like the biggest deal that you guys actually set up a retrofit program in 2025 for heat pumps. Wow. Yeah. So what, and you're an oil producing state like California, how did it go? Like, I'm, I'm curious specifically, like, how do you overcome from a policy perspective, the, the opposition? What, what were the arguments that were made that were successful in the face of natural opposition? Yeah, I think that uh, the task force really looked at the data around how much do heat pumps cost and I can kind of go through some of that. That were, those are my next slides. So maybe I'll kind of touch on it in that because um, you know the oil and gas industry had a seat on the task force. Um, we are going to reevaluate the technology that's required because we are requiring specific technology um, here and a move to electric technology because that is clearly sort of the technology that's available and cost effective today. We will do a full review of technology every four years um, and of like sort of what's in this policy, uh, but. You know, I think that the task force that recommended this to us unanimously with full consensus said, um, you know, this has a really high impact climate benefit. All of these recommendations, this whole policy reduce emission 80 per, emissions in buildings 80% by 2040 um, because zero electricity emission, uh, zero emission electricity is coming. Um, we know that electrifying space and water heat um, also helps with methane emissions, right? Which has a big climate benefit. So they looked at, we built a whole policy design tool for them where they could see the climate benefits of different sets of requirements. And they saw that they really couldn't get even near their goal of zero um, net zero energy by 2040 if they weren't requiring electrification. And then we looked at all the cost studies that we did and the analysis in our renewable heating and cooling plan. And they saw that often you can install a heat pump and get a better outcome for the same cost. Uh, and the example I often give um, is like a rooftop unit, right? Like if you, today, all those boxes on top of all the low flat, you know, warehouses, retail buildings all over Denver are um, a furnace and an air conditioner inside the box. You can buy a box that has a gas furnace and a heat pump inside the box, same price for the box. Runs on the same electrical capacity as the air conditioner runs on today. You keep that gas back up. Remember, this is not full electrification that's required. Uh, by keeping gas back up, you don't need electrical upgrades, your operational costs don't go up, and the heat pump covers 80 to 90 percent of your heating needs. In Denver, it also lowers all your cooling costs because it's more efficient than that air conditioner that you used to have. Like That's what starts in 2025. Stop putting furnaces and air conditioner boxes on top of buildings. Start putting furnaces paired with heat pumps on top of buildings because it's a better outcome for the same cost. So our requirements in the task force, we, I saw the questions in the chat, like what is, how are we gonna determine what's cost effective? We need to develop a lot of those details as this rolls into building code on January 1st of 2025. So there's details to be worked out on how we set that cost test and we'll, that will be informed by all the incentives that we're gonna roll out between now and then. Um, but that's what the task force like saw the opportunity to do as we studied all of this technology is just deliver those better outcomes 
same cost. That's where we're starting. So this won't be every existing building getting fully electrified. In fact, very few of them will be fully electrified, but it will be a whole bunch of them getting partially electrified to start the transition. Um, I'll go on. There's always questions about the grid. Uh, our study and Excel Energy's own studies show that Denver's electric system, um, because of our high summer peak, um, can handle winter peaking, winter heating needs, um, especially if it's heat pumps, especially if it's partial electrification without any significant infrastructure uh, build out. And um, you know, yes, there might be need to be additional planning when you get to like full electrification, like down the road. Um, but that's not what we're doing today. And so we can do like a massive amount of the conversion without any infrastructure build out on our grid. Um, we'll have lots of support. This website is launched. Uh, I put the link in the chat already, uh, but there's gonna be a ton of outreach and education starting on all of this. We'll have extra support for all of our under-resourced buildings. Buildings, um, you can sort of see this inverted L on this map where uh, these are all of our sort of high uh, underserved neighborhoods, neighborhoods with uh, under-resourced populations. Uh, we'll be focusing on buildings with affordable units, those serving under-resourced communities. We'll co-create sort of which buildings get all the extra support um, by doing um, engagement in uh, our most under-resourced neighborhoods. And we're um, sort of mapping out that plan uh, right now. And then I mentioned that we'll be offering incentives. I, I think the, the, the group might just, like, this is unusual that Denver has money to run our own incentive program. So quick summary of that funding. We have the Climate Protection Fund it was a resident led initiative uh, that passed in November of 2020. So we have 35 to $40 million every year um, to spend across uh, six allowable uses. So buildings uh, and homes don't get all of the funding, of course, uh, but um, given how large of a portion they are of the um, of the emissions and the really big resiliency and climate justice benefits from electrification, uh, because um, we know that uh, gas systems that are inside people's apartments and condos, in this case, because that's what we're looking at our commercial and multifamily buildings, but those gas systems in low income housing are leaking carbon monoxide about 40% of the time. And they don't have carbon monoxide detectors 95% of the time. So it's a really big health uh, and safety benefit to get gas out of people's living spaces. Um, that was a big reason the task force said, uh, we need to make sure under-resourced buildings are going through this transition off of gas first. Um, put your resources there so that you're getting um, not just these energy efficiency and buildings benefits, but also adaptation and resiliency and environmental and climate justice benefits um, from the transition off of gas. So we'll be rolling out a lot of uh, pilot projects and incentives, um, as you saw in the schedule, for um, electrification specifically. Uh, we also have, I'll just touch on some of our other support programs. We have a smart leasing program. This is really for like kind of commercial retail office kind of spaces. Um, because it, it's important to align the incentives of or align the lease language so that tenants are helping and working with landlords to achieve high performance um, in commercial spaces. So we have a lot um, of resources on that. This program is sort of going to get up and running again. We ran it a couple of years ago and sort of put it on pause through the pandemic. Um, we give awards every, oops, somehow that went back. Uh, we give awards every year to high performing buildings. Um, this there's CPACE financing available to pay for 100% of improvements um, in buildings. And so, um, you know, there's just a lot of resources that we're trying to create to help building owners and managers um, with compliance and a lot of resources already in place. I might pause there before I go into new buildings um, and just see, were there other questions, other things you want me to cover, Sean? I haven't oh. been reading everything in the chat. I know, and unfortunately, I've been just fascinated by what you're saying. So I wasn't paying as much attention. I was seeing people going back and forth. Um, let's see, one of them, I think from Eric Blair was, how does the EUI performance requirements work in coordination with these prescriptive requirements at the time of replacement? Yeah, great question. Um, so putting in a heat pump really helps improve the EUI of a building. Uh, I can stop sharing for a moment. Um, so 
in depending on if it's water heat or space heat, it's sort of on the order of 10 to 25% reduction in EUI should be seen when you go from gas to a heat pump. So a lot of the prescriptive requirements are just making sure that that actually happens because today it's a lot harder to permit a heat pump than a gas system. Today, you get a quick permit for a gas system if it's the same gas system you already had. Um, that's what all the contractors are used to selling. And we don't want buildings falling through the crack, uh, cracks and just continuing to put in these gas systems and then missing their EUI targets because they missed the easiest chance they had to improve their EUI through electrification. So um, we just don't think all the electrification would have happened if we didn't also require it in code because there's so much momentum around just sticking in new gas systems like the old gas system. All right. And you guys have um, some effective techniques there. I call it teeth. <laughs> um, Scott Blunk wanted to know, does uh, Scott Blunk of SMUD, uh, does the cost effectiveness include the cost of climate change? Yes, uh, there's language in the ordinance, uh, which you can find if you look at just, if you just Google like Denver Municipal Code and then it's chapter 10, I think article 14. Um, if somebody really wants to go read the actual ordinance language. It's also on the, website I listed in the hub in sort of PDF form. Uh, and yes, there's language that says cost of the cost effectiveness test, and this is where we have to add a lot of detail, but um, shall be the price of a gas system plus the social cost of carbon of that gas system as compared to the price of the heat pump uh, system with all incentives, ours and Excel's and any federal incentives for heat pumps that exist. Um, and then with a tolerance for a five to 15% premium still to pay to be paid for the heat pump system. So it is not cost parity, it is near cost parity. Uh, and we just have to work out all the details of exactly how that um, will be analyzed in a standard way. That is remarkably thorough. Um, Tom Cabot asks, are buildings now required to prepare for fees to prepare a feasibility assessment for heat pumps if they apply to use gas heat and gas water heat? For instance, basically, are they required to prove that heat pumps are inconvenient to them now? That starts January 1st of 2023, where to put in a gas system, you, they will have to do two out of three things. They will have to either um, submit a feasibility report, make sure the gas system is correctly sized, because they're often oversized today per current code, or do a gas pipe leakage test. So they won't have to do the feasibility report, but I think most will pick that when they have to pick two out of three to put in a gas system starting January 1st, 2023. Brilliant. And a, a whole bunch of people here are listening very carefully, believe me. <laughs> like, like where, What page is that? <laughs> um, uh, Liana Zhang Rossetti asks, what about when a water heater fails and needs to be replaced ASAP within a few hours? How will this be done for the 2025 requirement? Would that situation be considered not cost effective? Yeah, we'll have an emergency replacement clause, and so this just won't capture emergency replacements. There's some, um, we're dealing with emergency replacement with my partner, and he got an emergency electric resistance water heater in, in, while waiting for the, um, the heat pump to arrive. And mm -hmm. you can get 120 volt ones, you know, like 30 gallons, even 40 oh. gallons, you can just plug into any outlet in your house and have 40 gallons of hot water. It's not as good as, but it's, you know, it's hot water. You know, it's, it's the real thing. So it's just like a temporary tank. Um, let's see if there's a whole bunch of them down here. Uh, let's see. And I don't I, know how much you want to make sure because I know we only have 30 minutes. Yes, do we want to keep that? going on existing buildings or do folks, do you have an audience that would be interested in what we're doing on new buildings also? Because I. Well, I mean, it's hard. There's, uh, you know, 93 people, um, but uh, go on existing. Aaron McDade is. <laughs> We can just keep going on existing building questions. Um, do you want like the one minute on new buildings? We are updating our building code. Do, we are do, the, new building. do the new building. I, I won't do the whole presentation. Keep going on existing, but so that folks know, I will go put in the chat our building code update process. We have code committees. We have nine meetings of our IECC energy code committee starting today. So if you want to follow our code update process, I'll put a link in the chat about that. I'm happy to keep going with questions on existing buildings and not run through my new building slides, but um, we will be updating our building code and considering how to take a big step in new buildings and new uh, residential and homes um, for, towards net zero energy. But. I think you should show at least a few more of your slides. We, we okay. have more questions and you can answer them in the chat afterwards if you don't have to run immediately. 
I don't have to run immediately, but I think you have another speaker up, right? Oh yeah, um, in, in four minutes. <laughs> <laughs> Perfect. Uh, so um, we have uh, kind of a number of regulations for new buildings uh, in Denver. We've got the Denver Building and Fire Code. We also have a voluntary Denver Green Code. And then we have some other requirements. Everybody has to meet the zoning code, which um, touches on this a bit. And our green building ordinance is mandatory for all new buildings over 25,000 square feet. It layers on top of our base code. So like I said, we're going through um, a code adoption process. Uh, I'll try to put it in the chat just after I'm done speaking. But if you Google Denver code adoption process, you'll find all the details about all our code committees. Uh, we're at this point where our technical advisory committees start meeting today. Um, and they'll make recommendations to the city around what moves into code later in the summer. Um, we have a lot of drivers behind our work, um, one of them being getting to net zero energy uh, by 2030. Um, and uh, like I mentioned, the green building ordinance sort of layers on top of code. Um, so I, maybe I'll just pause, I'll, I'll stop there because um, it does sort of mean that all buildings are going a little bit even beyond where our code uh, lands. Uh, maybe I'll just go back here. We do define net zero energy as all electric, highly efficient, 100% renewable, but that's not on every individual building. That's including all that 80% grid renewables, but new buildings need to contribute some, as do existing buildings, to kind of closing the gap um, to get to 100% renewable. Um, so I think that's it. We're also, well, I'll pause, maybe I'll mention this too, because folks always ask with new buildings about embodied carbon. We did an embodied carbon inventory. You can find it on our website. You can see how embodied op or operational emissions over a building's life are much bigger. They're the blue part um, up until the grid gets really clean. And as the grid gets really clean and we move to all electric new construction, um, which in our plans is 2027, um, but could end up being sooner. I think we'll see where the code committees go. Um, over time, um, embodied carbon becomes a bigger and bigger part of sort of life cycle emissions for a building. And so we're also starting to look at embodied carbon through our code process. Woo! Fantastic. Um, Eric Blair is saying, was just about to ask about embodied carbon. There's a wonderful graph, by the way. Uh, does it include the refrigerant global warming potential? Um, yeah, yeah, it does. In our, um, it does in our embodied carbon inventory, I believe. Uh, but there's a lot of detail that we still embodied carbon's new, right? So, um, yes, right. but we need to look at all of those things a lot. Uh, Eric Morrill, um, electrician, electrification consultant in the Bay Area, he says, as we're installing all these new machines, is there any discussions about crafting city regulations to push back on planned obsolescence, improving repairability, like the recent UK proposal to require parts to be replaceable? And I know like Lennox, for instance, is especially difficult compared to others because of proprietary parts and like, mm. so. Just... There's probably folks thinking about that nationally. That's the kind of thing that's very hard to do at the city level. Uh -huh. um because you don't regulate like all manufacturers or even all sales right like what if we said you can't sell a part the, you can't sell a system that not doesn't have easy easy replaceability in denver well people can just go buy it just outside denver right so <laughs> there's others that i'm sure know far more about that than than me well um that was fantastic and there's a whole bunch of people who are like you know sticking stuff in the chat there so um, with that, thank you so much, Katrina. Uh, your policies are so impressive. I mean, they really are leadership policies. That was an incredible presentation of accomplishments of policymaking in Denver. Bravo. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And um, I put my email in the chat if folks have follow-up questions. I'll try to get back to some chat questions there for a little bit, but- um, Thank you. Okay, sounds good. All right, take care. Thanks so, for having me. Thanks for coming.